started. There we go. Good to be with you all. Let's uh, start with a creepy slide. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, part two of worldly things. Uh, we covered uh, two weeks ago. We covered uh, the lust of the flesh. Today we're going to cover lust of the eyes, and then uh, in a few weeks after the Sabbath, after trumpets, we'll cover the last part of this series with the pride of life. So um, yeah, things are close, aren't they? Um, and uh, Kevin, uh, your announcement you know, resonates in this very thing. I mean that. Uh, the three things that take down mankind, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, are, are, are they're upon us. Uh, they're, the spirit of Antichrist is certainly here. And uh, worldliness is described, and I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, world, worldliness is described as the love of beauty or nice things without a corresponding love of righteousness. Right? you got to put things decently and in order. So let's start with our, our keynote, um, 1 John, starting in verse uh, 15 of chapter 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So in this passage, the apostle classifies sin in three different categories, basically. And I think when we examine these things, we understand better the dynamics of sin, and therefore you're not as easily deceived by sin, and you have, are able to have victory over sin. So the second characteristic today is uh, that we're talking about is the lust of the eyes. This is the same word, lust, in the, as the lust of the flesh, as epithumia, and we talked about that a couple weeks ago. It deals with the sinful focused desire of the eyes here, or covetousness, if you will. They all are forms of covetousness, and this is one. Uh, the word eyes, you probably recognize the Greek word is ophthalmos, where we get, you know, opth yeah, ophthalmo ophthalmology. There we go. And then uh, to kick off this verse, verse 17 tells us the world is passing away, which it is. Know that of a truth, and the lust thereof. But he that is doing the will of God is abiding forever. So we have, most of us have two eyes that work. Each eye weighs approximately 28 grams or so, less than an ounce. <laughs> They're made up of more than 200 million working parts, and they serve a function that takes up about half the brain. So uh, I was reading the Discovery Eye Foundation, and they said the process that your eyes process more than 36,000 pieces of information every hour, and that your eyes on average blink 17 times per minute, or over 14,000 times per day, and over 5 million times per year. You probably blinked while I was saying it. Timmy's counting them right now. If you're Joel Osteen, it's probably more. A blink usually lasts from 100 to 150 milliseconds, and it's possible to blink five times in a second. Each eye contains 107 million cells. This is your science lesson for you. But here's my point is all of them, so those cells are light sensitive. And the human eye can detect uh, about 10 million colors, and it's capable of detecting just a single photon of light. We see with our brain, not with our eyes, right? The brain is more like the, the camera and the, your eyes, the lens, the capture, right? Our eyes function that way, capturing the light, reflecting off of objects, and sending that data back to our brain. Without any light, you'd be totally blind, right? So think about that in a spiritual sense as well. And we'll talk more about the light of the eye as we go forward. I wanted to hit a definition of covetousness from the Cambridge Dictionary, right? Wanting to have something too much, especially something that belongs to somebody else. Right? And uh, there's some synonyms there for you. 
the lust of the eyes, a lot of people hear that word lust and they automatically think, you know, uh, in a sexual connotation or male, female, whatever. And that is nowhere near the truth. While that's something that definitely people do have covetousness over, there's a lot more. I mean, you could go to food, gluttony, right? You can go to position or power. There's lots of different things that we have covetous for. Let's go back to the beginning, or as uh, they say in the Greek, Genesis. In Genesis 2.15, we read, the Lord, took, the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. That was Adam's job. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, because he's a good God. He spoke a law here. You can do this, and then you can't do this. The Lord, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you are eating thereof, you shall surely die. Now, some have mistaken that uh, Eve didn't know this command, and they, that she ate it ignorantly. Why does God hold her accountable for that? And that's not true. She knew. As a matter of fact, she's going to say it a, a little bit in chapter 3, right? Enter the Nakash. Satan. Now, the serpent was more subtle. The word serpent is Nakash. He was a shining one, hissing, mutterer, obviously um, wiser than all the beasts of the field. Right? As it says, more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he comes and he says to the woman, Yay, hasn't God said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. So she already knew, right? She repeats back basically what God had said, whether repeated by Adam or direct from the Lord God. But the tree of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. She was fully aware of God's law. One law that we know of at this point. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God does know in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So Satan entices Eve based on the natural desire for food, knowledge, etc. And then when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So we see the original sins, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life right in here. Temptation enters us through these, basically these three doors. And that's how it entered in the garden from the beginning. If it works, why change it, right? And that's the way Satan's thinking. So Eve experienced this lust of the flesh. She saw that tree was good for food. The lust of the eyes, that it was pleasant to the eyes. And the pride of life, a tree that was desired to make one wise, to be as God. Covetousness is written about in the Bible probably more than almost any other subject. And covetousness is idolatry as well. So in any idolatry is covetousness. Frankly, and we've talked about this in the past, if you knowingly transgress any commandment, you're coveting before you do so. Right? And you're also violating the first commandment, having other gods before you. I like to look at the first and tenth as those bookends that uh, if you're doing those, You'll, you'll be all right. But you can't do it of the flesh. right? You have to do it of the spirit. Otherwise, you will fail. There's a purpose to the law. So, in Second Peter, uh, we read about covetousness. Let's, uh, let's pick it up here in verse 12. But these, as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil. Now, they're not created to be taken and destroyed, but if you are in that condition, 
That's your, that's your end. You're, you're going to be destroyed, right? They speak evil of the things they understand not, and they shall utterly perish in their own corruption. No second chance for them. Utterly perish. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Right? They're just... that. Think of that rioting in the daytime. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and that pride of life. It's all in there. Right? And they'll receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings. They're fooling themselves while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and a heart they've exercised covetous practices. Cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bethor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. And you can read about that in Numbers, chapter 22 through 25, if you'd like. Jesus said that the eye is the lamp of the body. Let's read here. We'll start uh, Matt 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, so don't covet these things here, with that moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What are you placing your heart on? See, that's where covetousness comes in. You can covet in a good sense, or you can covet in a bad sense, right? So, I mean, uh, Paul says, uh, covet the earnestly the good gifts, the better gifts, right? You can covet good things. You can covet to serve the Lord. Right? It's a matter of the heart and a matter of the context. Now, notice what he says here. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. Therefore, if the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? And then he says in the following verse that no man can serve two masters. For either he will love the one and hate the other, you can't serve God, God and mammon. Mammon is a uh, Syriac word. It could be material things. The God of riches is where it's directly from in the Syriac. But he's resorting, exhorting his followers to store up treasures in heaven. If, if their treasure's there, their heart will be there. And then he describes this good eye or bad eye. What are you focused on? What are you looking for? If the eye is good, it's focused on a single object, one master. But if it's bad, then it tries to focus between two objects. And thusly, it's not able to pay either of them proper attention. Right? The lust of the eyes is when the eye catches notice of things that it wants and it doesn't have. In some cases, as I said, it may be things. In other cases, it may be people or situations. But in any case, we're told to avoid it because it comes not from the Father, but is of the world. We have to keep our eyes singly focused on the kingdom. You can't walk in both worlds. And I think too many times, too many of us fall into that trap. And it says back in that Peter verse, it says that our hearts are exercised to covetousness. I think we exercise ourselves to that. And we don't put ourselves in check. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. And we can have control of these things. The Spirit is stronger than the flesh. So in Exodus, we see the command for the Ten Commandments, from the Ten Commandments, right? As I, when we talked about that, that's kind of the foundation, and that's the book ends. That's uh, Exodus 20, 17, to not covet anything that your neighbor's. That can be summed up a covetous desire for possessions or persons, usually with the intent to not benefit them, but to gratify yourself. Right? Why? Because there is an eye in the center of every sin. It's been said selfishness is the parent of all sin. Our uh, English word, <coughs> covet, comes from grasping for more. 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 And isn't that our culture today? More. More. 
I don't want extra cheddar. I want flavor blasted cheddar goldfish, right? I need to take it to the next level, right? You don't need a hot pepper. You need a scorpion pepper or ghost pepper, right? Dictionaries define covet as grasping greedy, greed of wealth with a view of hoarding it. But this all springs from a selfish nature because the carnal man is selfish. Therefore, the carnal man covets. He covets, he steals, he lies, he commits adulteries, murders, disregards others. Do you ever relate to Eve? I mean, here she was in the garden of Eden, the garden of God. Paradise, they call it, right? Paradise. Have anything you want here, just don't eat that one too. She felt deprived, even though she had all of that. Who knows? Thousands and thousands of different kinds of food she could have maybe took and, and tasted instead. What about us? Especially here in America. We live in one of the richest countries in the world, right? And most of our focus is on what we want that we don't already have. And that's the problem. This attitude makes it difficult and almost impossible to enjoy what you do have. And you know what? There's a lot of people who would trade places with you. We seem to have a rampant desire for what we don't have or can't have, and that's not walking in the Spirit. I found that people in this country comparatively are the most, I guess I'll be nice and say, the most dissatisfied people on earth. It's never enough. We encourage greed and need. We always want something we don't have. And once we get it, we want the next thing. Advertisers always send in that message, you won't be happy till you get our product. Oh, I want to be happy. I'll get that product. Oh, now you won't be happy unless you get this product. This is better than that product. Oh, I want that product. Right? <laughs> so, as Christians, I think we need to evaluate our sense of happiness. We're inundated daily with messages saying we got to have more, something newer, or something we don't have. And that's the foundation to covetousness. And we live in a, a land of plenty. If I stop right here and tell you, look, the way to, to, to beat that is to be thankful. Really, truly thankful. Not just saying thankful, but then I want more. Then it would be enough. If you got that and walked away, if you stop listening after that, and if you take that piece to heart, you'll be in a better spot. But we got a ways to go yet. So don't go away. Ecclesiastes, we're going to read this through verse 11 on two slides. There's one alone, there's not a second, yea, he has neither child nor brother, yet there is no end of all his labor, neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. It's, mean, it's meaningless, it's a miserable business, he said. My eyes aren't content with what I have. He that loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loves abundance with increase. That's America. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they're increased that eat them. And what good are they to the owners thereof, except the beholding of them with their eyes? We should heed Solomon's warning. A couple of bad examples of covetousness here. Aiken's breaking heart. So you know this uh, story. The Israelites conquered the land of Jericho and they received the specific commandment of the Lord not to take any of the accursed things found in the city. The city was doomed to destruction, but the silver, gold, vessels of bronze and iron were to go into the treasury of the Lord in uh, Joshua 6, 18 and 19. 
Achan, however, blatantly disobeyed the command of the Lord, and he took what he wasn't supposed to, and he hid it under his tent. And when confronted for his sin, this is what he said. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus I have done. When I saw among the spoils of a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. His eyes led to coveting, which ultimately led to his death and the death of others, including his family. Right? Son, covetousness leads to death, ultimately, as all sin does. Right? David and Bathsheba, right? Another situation where covetousness ruined many people. He saw the woman bathing, washing herself. He saw she was beautiful to look upon. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. Pride of life also involved here. Knew that she was, found out she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And yet, that he um, took what was not his. And sinned, sinned grievously before the Lord. He put Uriah in the front of the battle then to get killed. Just as he took the sword himself and laid it to Uriah's throat. Why? And this is this is King David. Right? The guy who wrote the Psalms. Right? A lot of them. Holy, zealous for the Lord. But even he fell because of the covetousness of the eye. And this was for an example. Right? To not do this. So not only does Uriah now die, and a bunch of the, the servants of David also died, the last line there in both, in the battle. He said, hey, let's do this. Let's go back into battle and let's send Uriah up in front. And then on top of that, the child dies. Right? The child dies. He's dead. That's the end result of covetousness. Right? He said, no servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees, who were also covetous, heard all these things and they derided him. Because they were covetousness. Their eyes were not single to God. It was focused on themselves and their power and their position and their wealth. And then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, what will you give me? And I will deliver him, Jesus, unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver, and from that time he sought the opportunity to betray him. Covetousness led Judas to betray Jesus. And then said one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him? Why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was, what was put therein. See what the destruction that comes from lust of the eyes can bring. Let us be instructed and exhorted from God's word to flee from covetousness, to pursue the God who is our inheritance, to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Uh, Hebrews 12, 2, for your notes. Covetousness makes God mad. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hand of an angry living God. Right? The wicked boasts of his heart's desire and blesses the covetous whom the Lord... You think that that's just the pagan? That's the people who aren't in church, who aren't coming to the feast. Hmm. Isaiah 57, 17, For the iniquity of his covetousness I was wroth and smote him. I hid me and was wroth, and he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. We are to be like God. We are also to hate covetousness, right? He even told them to choose out Leaders who hated covetousness. Let's, let's read this. Um, Exodus 18, verses 19 through, I think we go to 22. Yep. Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give you counsel, and God shall be with you. Be you for the people to Godward, 
that you may bring the causes unto God. And you shall teach them ordinances and laws and shall show them the way wherein they must walk and the works that they must do. Moreover, you shall provide out of all these people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be the rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they will bring to thee, but every small matter they shall judge, so it shall be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. He that hates covetousness shall prolong his days. Do you hate covetousness? And I don't mean in other people. We laugh. I tell you what, you know, revisiting this message, I had to look at myself again. Right? And I hope you all look at yourself. What about covetous company? 1 Corinthians 5. 9 through 13, I wrote to you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with the covetousness, covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that's called a brother be a fornicator, a covet, or a covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one no, not even to eat with. But what do I have to judge them that are outside? Do you not judge them that are within? But them that are that are without God, God is judging. To those outside, God is judging. Therefore, put away from yourselves that wicked person. Do you look for fruit in yourself? Do we look for fruit in each other and, and gently admonish one another? Do we see things like covetousness before they become death? or adultery, or murder, or whatever have you. The sin starts in here, or in here, technically. Covetousness defiles us. Jesus said, that which comes out of the man, that is defiling the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Covetousness is tricky. It's sneaky. you got to watch out for it. we are told to beware. And he said to them, Luke 12, 15 through 17, I know I'm not reading all these, but they are on screen for you. Be, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things that he's possessing. And he spoke a parable to them, saying, that The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room to bestow my fruits? And he said, This I will do. I will pull down my barns and build greater barns, and there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, Soul, you've laid up much goods for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Then who shall those things be that you have provided? So I thought about it. I was like, wow, man, this guy worked hard, built his barns or whatever. He's going to sit back and retire. Is that bad? No, it's not bad. But he was trusting in those things instead of trusting in the living God. That's where his covetousness was. He trusted in the wrong things. His treasures were on the earth, not in heaven. Covetousness kills, right? So is the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which takes away the, the life of the owners thereof. Right? Proverbs 1, 16 through 19. Too often we spend our lives comparing ourselves to others, and we covet where they are and what they have. I'll tell you a little story about that. Consider the ant. There's a fellow named Bob Zanes in Paint Rock, Texas, who came up with this cool illustration. He had a problem with stinging ants in his yard. Right? So, 
you don't want to don't want those around your yard, around your family, around your kids, your animals. So he put a little circle of poison around the mound, locked up, keep, kept his family away from it. Thinking the tiny granules of poison were food, the ants began to pick them up and carry them throughout the colony. Now, Bob returned later to see how well the poison was working, and many stinging ants were carrying the poison down into their mounds. But then he noticed a little hole in the circle of the poison. Some of the poison was moving the opposite way. Some other non-stinging ants found this food and were stealing it from that neighbor. Thinking they were giving the other ants treasure, they unwittingly poisoned themselves. When we see somebody with more than we have, we must beware. The hunger to beg, borrow, or steal our way to what's theirs may poison us spiritually. Paul writes, we dare not to make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. And so it's not wise to measure yourself at any against somebody else for the things that they have, because all those things are perishing. That's not treasure in heaven. That's treasure on earth. Luke 12, 21 through 23, so is he that is laying up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Right? Don't take thought for your life. What you'll eat, neither for the body, your clothes, what you're going to put on, because life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Right? What do you trust in? Who do you trust in? He says, consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They don't plant, and yet they have seed and food. They don't have store hard barn, but God cares for them and feeds them. And he says, how much more are you better than the birds? So for those people who want to put animals on the same plane as humans, eh, you're a special creation, guys. You're the children of God. So why do we think about things? Can, if by thinking of it, can you add a, 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 you know, inches to your height? I guess with surgery you might be able to. And then he says, consider the lilies. How they grow, they don't toil and they don't spin. Yet Solomon in all his splendor and all his glory wasn't arrayed and dressed like one of these. Right? A flower can be really beautiful. You take the time to look at it. Right? Walking through life, smell the flowers. And if God so clothes the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow it's cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, or you of little faith? He tells us that's a faith problem when we covet other things. Right? So he says, don't seek what you'll eat, what you'll drink. No, neither be of doubtful mind for all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father is knowing that you have need of these things. But rather, he tells us to seek the kingdom of God. First, and then all these things will be added unto you. Remember when he told Solomon, you know, you can have, you know, this, this, or this, and Solomon's like, uh, give me the wisdom to judge your people. He's like, because you didn't ask for these other things, I'm going to give you what you asked for, the wisdom, and then I'm also going to give you these other things. Put the kingdom of God first. Fear not, little flock, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do you ever think about that? That's kind of empowering, isn't it? Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. His will shall be done in each of us. We need to put the kingdom first. The things on this world are perishing. Be they people, be they things. Sell all that you have, give alms, provide yourself bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that fails not, where no thief is approaching, neither moth is corrupting. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Stay awake, stay wary, don't be asleep. Wake up, church of God! Hi. <laughs> that was Luke 12. <laughs> Ezekiel, the watchman, here in Duke. Ezekiel 33, starting in verse 30, says, 
also you, son of man, the children of your people are still talking against you by the walls and in the doors of the houses, and speak one to another, everyone to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what, the, what is the word that is coming forth from the Lord. And they come unto you as the people are coming, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. This isn't the people out there. This is God's people. Here, it was Israel of old. Right? Today, it's us. Do we come to hear His words, but then not do them? It's so much easier for me to decide to do some of these physical traits, right? Clean, unclean, or whatever. But when it comes to me taking the covetousness out of my heart, how? Well, that's what he expects. He doesn't want our hearts to go after covetousness. We're supposed to endure the temptations of the world. James 1. Blessed is the man, starting verse 12, blessed is the man that is enduring temptation. For when he's tried, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. you got to love him first. Because if you don't love him first, you're not really loving him. Okay? Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away from his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Yeah, hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. But we're told to fight those temptations. There's no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and 14. It's been said that opportunity knocks once, but temptation beats on the door every single day, every hour. I know that a lot of people, and that's why I underlined and bolded the part that I did up here. A lot of people look at the will to, with the temptation make a way of escape, and they're looking for the escape. But you also may have to bear it. You may have to, you may not be able to escape, but you have to withstand and fight. Sometimes you flee, sometimes you fight. Okay? We fight so we can flee, so we can fight again. The noblest of pirates would do that. What's that? Makes you stronger, right? That's exercising yourself to godliness. Because you can have faith when, you're, when you endure, endure with the right heart and the right focus and don't get puffed up that it was you, you're better able to withstand the next time. Or strengthen your brother or sister who may need that. We're told to submit ourselves, therefore, to God. When we sin or we covet, we're not submitting to Him. And we call ourselves His. We're told to resist, fight the devil, and that He will flee. Oh, He's like a roaring lion. But when He meets a Samson or a Jesus, He's got no power. We're told that even though he is a roaring lion walking about in 1 Peter 5, devouring who he will, that we're supposed to resist him steadfast in our faith. Steadfast in our faith. Well, I can't do I can't beat him. I can't bury that or I can't beat that temptation. Yes, you can. Because it's not you who fights. It's the Lord who fights for you, just like Israel of old. You put that Ark of the Covenant out in front of you, and let the Lord fight your battle, and you will win. Don't tell me you can't, because the Bible says you can. And if we speak not according to that word, we're lying. Because we covet us, and we covet other things. You can't have both. Nor do you want both. We 
We're told to be looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. The destruction that the lust of the eyes brings should be warning enough to you. But we don't see it in our own selves and in our own backyard. Why? Because we're not looking. Because there's another devil trick. He's going to get you to look at someone else instead of looking at yourself in that mirror. And before I tell you the good news, I'm going to tell you the bad news. If you're sinning against God in these ways, it's, your sin is separating you from God. He's not forsaking you. You're forsaking Him. And yet you're honoring Him with your lips. It's no different than it was in Isaiah's time, Jeremiah's time, or Jesus' time. It's no different. So look at yourself and let the Word of God confuse you. Don't be afraid of it. Because he, whom he loved, he chastised. And he makes you better. Not bitter, not afraid. He doesn't give you the power, the spirit of fear, but the power of a sound mind. Your sound mind has to know what you're fighting against. It has to know the enemy. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Anybody had to hold a knife up against your throat and tell you you're going to do this the last time you sinned? Be it covetousness, lust. Maybe you didn't think about it and took something home from work that you got to bring back. Nobody put a knife to your throat to have you make you have a burst of anger, unjustifiable. Or to slander your brother. And yet, you do it. God says that shouldn't be. And by the Spirit of God, you have the power to overcome those things. Our job is to resist. Remember the story of the rock again? The, push, the guy pushing on the rock? For many years he pushed on the rock. God told him to push the rock. He doesn't move it at all. He gets frustrated. God says, What? Look at you, man. You're well-muscled. You're strong. You're weathered. You can handle all kinds of adversity. But I haven't moved the rock. He goes, I didn't tell you to move the rock. I told you to push against the rock. Be faithful and push against the rock. Or lean on the rock and push against sin. I should say. Not creepy for you, Ron. Psalm 101, verse 2, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. You can walk within your house or outside your house with a perfect heart. Don't trust your heart. It's desperately wicked. But you can make it perfect by setting your treasure in the right place. That's why I set no wicked thing before my eyes. Don't put anything else in front of God. I mean, that's not just talking, looking at, you know, somebody committing the theft or pornography or something like that. I'll set no wicked thing before my eyes. It doesn't mean you don't witness these things. It means you don't put it before you as, oh, I want that. That's my goal. Oh, I'll be happy when I have that. But I can have that and have this too. Hmm. We're told to keep our heart, Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We've got a heart problem. The great physician is the only one who can fix it. Put away from you a froward mouth, perverse lips. Put them far from you. Let your eyes look on right on. Stay single eyes. Focus on the kingdom. Let your eyelids look straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Turn not to the right hand or the left hand. Remove your foot from evil. These are clear instructions. And they're even spoken 
in times before the Spirit of God was poured out upon the church. And now we can fulfill them through the Spirit. Jesus told us, you have heard it said from of old time, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whosoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if your right eye offend you, pluck it out and cast it from you. That guy's plucked out both. For it should be profitable for you that one of your members should perish and not that your whole body should be cast into Gehenna. And if your right hand offend you, cut it off and cast it from you. For it's profitable for you that one of your members should perish and that not your whole body be cast into hell. Cut off whatever it is that desire is, because that's evil. It's better that you enter the kingdom. Whatever that desire is, it's not talking physically pluck out your eye or your hand. It's, it's saying to cut off that desire. You want eternal life. Put that front, put that front and center. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrite. Can I word that? The sinners in the church are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrite. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burning? He that is walking righteously and speaking uprightly, he that is despising the gain of oppression, that is shaking his hands from a holding of bribes, that is stopping his ears from hearing of blood and shutting his eyes from seeing evil. Keep all that stuff away from you. Know the devil's trap. It's to get your heart to be placed somewhere else. That's idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. Psalm 119, some of my favorite psalms. Let's start before this. Let's go up to verse 32. You got your scriptures open. I will run the way of your commandments when you shall enlarge my heart. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. That's dedication. Before the Spirit's given, too. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of your commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto your testimonies and not to covetousness. Continuing on. Turn away my eyes from beholding vanity and quicken me in your way. Establish your word unto your servant who is devoted to your fear. Turn away my reproach which I fear, for your judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after your precepts. Quicken me in your righteousness. We long for the precepts of God rather than covetousness. All other commandments seem to forbid outside noticeable sin. Except maybe one. But this one also teaches and reaches into the inner heart, to the motives. And it condemns evil as entertaining the thoughts of wrongdoing. If you just entertain those thoughts, that's wrong. Jeremiah 17.9 describes the heart as desperately, is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And Psalm 94.11 says, The Lord knows the thoughts of man that they're all vanity. Whatever we covet, be it good or bad, becomes our goal in life. What are you going to covet? If we covet the wrong things, we have the wrong goals, and we are going to sacrifice things of great value in our efforts to attain what has little, ultimately, little eternal value. It's said that covetous people are held by their own greed like beasts with cords or fish with nets or men with chains. Coveting captures our mind and it tears down our convictions. Even though you know this is wrong, you put up a wall because you're desiring the wrong thing. Your eye is not single anymore. So you cannot focus on one or the other correctly. You're going to choose one. Now you may choose the one and then think you can keep jumping back to the other. 
your heart can only take so much before it gets to your conscience. A covetous person is me-centered. And as you indulge these covetous behaviors, you will find that you begin to neglect your life with God. You will not have time for His service. And I don't mean a church thing. Serving Him. You won't have time for Bible reading outside of whatever you may do. That's that. You won't have time for prayer. And earnestly, you'd maybe just end up with some mechanical rote stuff at meals. Covetousness will consume you. People will never stop dying and being destroyed because they will never stop wanting more than they have. Turn away my eyes from beholding vanity. Covetousness is vanity. I would be remiss if I didn't touch on, on the put off, put on principle here. Let's read in Ephesians chapter 5. Be you therefore followers of God. If you call yourself followers of God, then follow Him. If you're calling yourself a follower of God and you're not following the way He says to go, you're not a follower of God. You're just saying you are. Right? As dear children. I picture that little boy as they're all mimicking their parents as they walk along, right? Andy Griffith, Andy and Opie, right? Skip the stone, skip the stone, whatever. And walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and given Himself for us, as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But, fornication, all uncleanness, not just some, or covetousness, let it not even be once named amongst you as becoming saints. In other words, hey, this is your job description as a, a holy one of God. Hey, be holy. Nothing unclean. Not just you're a little more clean than the pagan. Not, oh, you keep a Sabbath holy day and you eat clean food, not unclean food. If you do that and you're covetous as your neighbor, you're both going to the same place. And it ain't redemption. It ain't a second chance. We need to fight for the faith. Earnestly contend. Continuing. Also, Keep away filthiness and foolish talking and jesting, which are not convenient, but rather the giving of thanks. There it is. If you are thankful to God for what you have, starting with that you're His and the Spirit that He gives you and the salvation He's promised you, everything else falls in. And you will find that you're more giving at that point rather than more covetousness. You end up the opposite, the put off, put on. For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor a covetous man who's an idolater, because covetry is idolatry, you're putting something else in front of God, where you say, don't do that. Then you don't have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Any inheritance. Nothing. Cut off out of the will. Let nobody deceive you with vain words. For the... These things comes the wrath of God on the children of disobedience. And yet, I think that sin, as it, deceiving as it is, creeps in. The world, the flesh, and the devil, they all want that same thing. You're destructive. They don't care how they get it. We like to think that's someone else. Well, I hope it is. Because it should be. I'm not saying a covetous thought won't enter your mind. But once you play with it, it's yours, man. And you chose the wrong way, and you need to repent from it. Myself, I'll include myself in there. Like I said, I have to look deep in, in myself in this again, as we all should every time we're in the Word. I say, clean me from the unclean things, Lord. Keep me from those ways. And then trust Him to do so. Colossians 3, 1 through 4, If you then being risen with Christ seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting on the right hand of God, set your affection on the things above, not on the things of earth. 
for you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you shall also appear with him in glory. Amen. Set your affections and treasures in heaven. Mortify or kill, therefore, the things about you, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness. This is idolatry. Right? Concupiscence is the same type of thing as covetousness. Desire ardently. Comes from the, the word desire. Right? It's a bad desire, an evil desire. For which things, for the sake, sake, the wrath of God is coming on the children of disobedience. Double warning. Hey, if you do these things, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. I don't care how much you keep Sabbath, how much you read your Bible, I don't care how much you do clean on clean, I don't care if you keep the feast, I don't care what, if you're doing these things, you're not in the kingdom, man. That should be pretty powerful to you. And those are the weightier matters of the law, guys. Back in Ephesians 4, that you put off concerning the former conduct the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. You can do it. We're told to do it. Do it. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Right? And you can covet the good. Like I said, there's a good covetousness. Covet earnestly the best gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 31. And yet I show you a more excellent way. Wherefore, brethren, covet the prophecy and forbid not to speak with tongues. There's another good covenant. And here's another one. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You hunger and thirst after righteousness? Well, come to the Day of Atonement. I know you'll see that verse again, right? You hunger and thirst after righteousness? Really? Is that your aching desire? Not aching. Aching desire to be righteous. Make it your desire. You can choose that. You can put your heart there. When you choose a person in this world, you set your love on them, just like God set his love on us. Didn't, he didn't see us in swoon. Oh, I got it. He set his love. He chose us, and we choose who we love too. There's feelings involved in emotions. Don't get me wrong, but you that's a choice. Just like people fall out of love, which is a lie as well. It's their choosing not to, right? A lot of marriages is because they don't believe the vows for better or for worse, or for sickness and health. They, they, they believe, uh, I, I will love and honor you until I don't feel like it anymore, right? And that's another, covetousness, that's covetousness. That's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and again, the pride of life. But do you hunger and thirst for that righteousness to be holy? And if not, ask yourself, why not? I know the, the, the world is spinning. So many things are coming. Things are, are attacking. They're just life, and life happens. That doesn't change God's expectation. If we're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness, I will go out on the limb to say, maybe our treasure isn't all the way in the kingdom where it needs to be. Okay? And I think you can all own that. Because we're told to seek you first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all that other stuff is going to be added to you. And you won't, you won't complain about all that other stuff because you already are full with the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The extra is just add on stuff. Because he's our inheritance. We need that victory. The key to winning the battle over sin is simple. As I said two weeks ago, feed our spiritual nature through such things as prayer. And this is earnest, seeking, God-seeking stuff. Bible, not just rote. You can do these things without having your heart set on Him and His kingdom and righteousness, and you'll be just as empty as before. But you've got to choose to put your love there and not just go through the motions. Meditation, fasting, listening to sermons, Bible studies, fellowshipping with God's people, and of course, most of all, 
using God's Holy Spirit that He gave you to guard yourself and to have you walk in the way of righteousness and holiness. And then also, conversely, starve off the sinful side. Put off, put on. By bringing every thought into captivity. Every thought. How many slipped through on you a day? you got the Spirit to start winning that. Put that thought away. Have faith in Him. Flee from temptation. Again, he who fights and loves the way lives to fight another day. Sin depends on and grows out of the believing of certain lies. That this thing is good for me or better for me than what God has. And sin results from that misbelief that something contrary to the Word of God is good for you. No, God doesn't want you to have that other person's stuff. I don't care how much you prayed or a sign that you got from heaven. The Word of God tells you no. The second uncommon truth is I can't help myself. I've got to do it. The sin tells me I've got to do it. I'm helpless. I'm weak. We're going to sin all our days. Uh, temptation's bigger than me. That's not what God said. So either you're lying and or you're calling God a liar. And God said you could have victory. Covetousness is probably one of the more important things that I believe saints in the church today need to look at. Because I do believe that many are zealous for God. But sometimes I think there's a zeal that's really not according to the fullness of the knowledge of the gravity of sin and the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome. Keep on bringing that word into your heart. Hide it there. It doesn't mean keep it away from people. That means store it up because you're going to need it. And in those times of temptation, it's there. And you can use the Word of God to strengthen the Spirit in you to overcome. Because we are more than conquerors through Him who loves us and gave Himself for us. So I hope that, although that was sobering, it was also encouraging. And uh, that'll do it for our message today. So thanks for listening. I'll turn it back over to Kevin.